different seat, just a different perspective. Let's talk about business, right? Um, yeah, the use cases of AI within your specific industries, and at least we've got a very good representation of various industries in this, in this panel. Let's talk first about use cases of um, AI in your organization. Um, yeah, if, I think, Anthony, you've got a, a, sure. a, some set of slides to show. Uh, well, I can show the slides, but uh, I can actually talk you through it. It's easier uh, to maybe talk through. So uh, with Fraser's, we've, we're developing one of the largest projects in Thailand. It's a city within the city. It's called One Bangkok. It's uh, approximately 1.83 million square meters of GFA. It consists of hotels, residential, retail uh, uh, facilities. So one of the key challenges we've got is that this is a greenfield uh, development. So we wanted to do something very exciting. One of our key design principles was around smart cities, smart living, and sustainable principles. So when we looked at some of the technology we needed to deploy, we looked at it from a business case. Actually, we had uh, several business cases where we looked at. One was we have so many cameras and so many video feeds, how do we actually monitor those efficiently and effectively to give the best or the most appropriate public safety uh, to all the occupants of, of one Bangkok. So we looked at AI. How can we actually look at video processing, video image analysis, analytics, and see how we could actually develop those business cases to provide better services, better security services. Uh, we looked at, for example, how we do uh, repair and maintenance. How can we take the information we get from our IoT platforms, analyze it, and then give that back in more of a real-time or predictive maintenance scenario to make sure we provide better service to our occupants and tenants. Things like, for example, uh, car park management. We have a very large car park. How do we automate and understand the traffic within our car park, and how do we optimize that to get the best parking solutions for our tenants? So there were some of the challenges that we looked at. It always came back to a business perspective, and then we looked at how we could apply technology to actually get benefits for, for our occupants. All right. Um, in that short period of time, how, lo how long was um, this and... Okay, yeah, maybe you can answer it. I'll just uh, briefly take you through some of, the, some of the slides, maybe focus on, but some of the key ones we looked at was in the industry today, worldwide. 2017, we looked at 22% of people were actually investing in, in artificial intelligence. And then today, it's roughly around 41%. I think the key for us was that from our business, because we were green fields and we were very new and we were developing a city within a city, we had the opportunity to say how can we actually take the most advantage of technology in, in the market today and see how we apply it. And I think that was a, a great uh, opportunity for us. One of the other things I'd like to focus on was a little bit what Dr. Kim said earlier on was people have to take a chance. So uh, a lot of this technology that we're trying to, to, to deploy and use uh, throughout uh, uh, our development hasn't been used before in this scenario. So we needed to get the business to say, yes, we believe this is going to work. Now, that's always a challenge to convince different business users, uh, you know, what are the advantages of new technology? Is it going to cost too much? Am I really going to get the payback? So there's a lot of challenges in that internal uh, decision making within businesses to actually get to that right solution. Yeah. And I think the last thing I just want to say is, uh, you know, data is incredibly key. And uh, a lot of the panelists have already talked about, you know, some of the key issues around ethical management of data. And I think that's a key thing the industry needs to police ourselves as we move forward, not just rely on regulation from governments. Sure. Good print. Um, financial services has a lot of data, also has a lot of privileged information, privacy issues, kind of strong there too. Um, what are the opportunities for AI um, for financial services, but CLSA in specific? Yes, so at the stock brokerage firm in investment bank, I'm Credit Leone, CLSA, which I'm working at, we now own by um, CITIC Group, CITIC, which is one of the um, largest conglomerate in China. So you can imagine with China being at the forefront of making investment in artificial intelligence, of using uh, the abundant amount of data that they have in China um, potentially would allow some, both in terms of the country and some of the businesses that are operating there, leapfrogging many of their competitors. They have been, um, so they, we set up a financial technology arm, FinTech, which uh, both a goal to 
invest in specific um, artificial intelligence projects um, around the region. Uh, we also look at ways that we can partner with some AI um, specialized funds. With the business level itself, because there's a lot of disruption in the investment banking and brokerage world that you may be aware, the costs um, on commission, many of you here in the room, I'm sure, trade in the stock market, and not just in Thailand, but around the world. And the cost for you guys has been incrementally getting cheaper and cheaper, cheaper, coming down um, at the expense of our bonuses in the banking world, obviously. Um, but the artificial intelligence AI um, enables us to enter new areas of products and services um, to you. I'm sure there has been some brokers. CLSA is an institutional broker, so we don't come to you with a, with a retail product. But um, I know for the fact that there have been Taiwanese brokers who are based in Thailand, um, half Chinese, half um, so kind of uh, foreign brokers who also giving services on the private funds who is a, uh, you can call it robo-advisor, but on the, back, on the black box that is the back of the robo-advisor is the fact that um, the fund strategy can use the data and strategy that are based on some patterns of trading that they have seen, whether you may want a more hedge fund style, you can short the futures, you can long a stocks, and the, the pattern, the strategy when you buy and sell with certain stocks in a sector may vary. Sometimes when you trade around an earnings announcement, it's different timing, what strategy you can be used. And typically, some stocks, they do have a similar pattern that they trade before the earnings announce, after the earnings announce. Sometimes there are specific events, like the upcoming general election in Thailand, where we have seen data of how stocks have traded um, before the election, six months before the election, three months before, and after the election, how things come out. Of course, all this um, data and the analysis of it is not, not perfect. But often it takes out the emotion elements of how traders who would execute your orders, or even you yourself when you actually click the button to buy, to sell stocks, it takes out that element. So before in my industry, in finance world, we used to require um, many, many traders, sometimes up to 100 traders, um, to execute the client's orders. These days you may require just three or four people as a trader. So employment-wise, it's definitely a change. And even before AI comes about, you know, you only um, started doing program trading, start doing direct market access, DMA, start doing some algorithm. Um, so artificial intelligence allows us to, to use um, the data in a more efficient, effective manner and in a more timely fashion. And a lot of this now from the robo-advisor angle, from the hedge funds who've been set up around the world. I had another fund in my office the other day who is a fund management firm. And they take sustainable investment seriously, social impact investment. Yep which I'm sure many of you here may, may know about and care about, they input the criteria of both the corporate governance score, the CG score, they input the managerial um, quality score, um, put the accounting standard score, put in the transparency, the disclosures. So all the criteria that would make the company have strong, high corporate governance score and added in perhaps the sustainable angle, whether that company has the environmental policy, the impact on sustainable, the employment, the gender equality side of things, helping society at large and dealing with stakeholders. So they, they do score that and then they, they put this into, they rank the companies on that score and they put the valuations that's involved. So when, and it's a global fund, by the way, called Aberesk. And Aberesk would look at all these global scores and their fund managers is, uh, they only have one fund manager. The rest are robots. And so they do this in a very efficient manner, and the orders you know, can still come through brokers when they send orders, but it will come through a, a black box. We don't even see what they buy and sell during the day. We learn at the end of the day when it, the order feeds through. So it, it, it's a good thing than a challenging thing because it provides some challenges, and I may come to it later in detail, because sure. the Stock Exchange of Thailand, which I'm, I'm a governor of, on the board of governors, we, we face challenges because many of you heard the phrase uh, naked short selling. Often this fund sometimes have strategy not, not Aberest, which does a social responsible fund, but some funds which are hedge fund, they sell the stocks before they buy it. And often you cannot prove what stocks they're holding at certain time. Because they buy and sell through the program, through the AI, through the data that they analyze, that makes them, they can square their position within seconds. They can buy and sell, they can sell before they buy, and at the point of selling, no one can prove if they're actually physically holding that stock or sure. not. We may use, we come later to blockchain, which may help that, later on, but at this day, the SET has no 
blockchain used to identify exact millisecond if you're holding the stock when you're selling it. So we're so, living in an interesting world where... <laughs> so with these two uh, things in specific, the loss of employment of yeah. your brokers and then verifiability, the problem of verifiability. So you, you take a position that AI might in fact be drastic uh, and will give a drastic impact to financial services. Oh yes, services. for sure. It already so, has and you, you, see, you see the job employment loss, you've seen the fee structure that has to change, the, the, the models that we operate mm -hmm. has to change dramatically. Um, the way we interface with our clients, um, the way we, we, we work with our, our team and how we execute the orders, you know, and the regulation doesn't make it any easier because the rule of law in financial world is now they try to segregate uh, each institution and sure. the functions and, and how fund management can trade or give orders and so on and so forth. But in the future, I mean, it, give, it gives hope for me for, for, for tools for young um, people who want to understand um, investment. If they use the tools you know, wisely, you know, then that tool could become very useful for your financial planning, for your way to save, increase your savings. But on the other hand, it will increase market volatility because AI funds, they, if you notice on the New York Stock Exchange, at the end of the day, when they trade the last few minutes, it's very volatile. The price, the bid offers, sometimes can blink and flash and go through and disappear very fast. So clearly it's the robot, so clearly it's the, it's the hands of not, not humans who can execute those order in such, a, such a fast, so yes. on the net, then you think that AI is negative for financial services? It, it has its, like, like, like any new technology tools, it's up to the human to know how to use it. It's the double-edged sword, so it, it brings challenges. So it's up to the humans to learn how to use the new technology and what opportunity it, it can bring. Okay. There are a few other things on employment and how we employ people as well. Financial world is there when we employ staff. Sure. Sometimes we put through an AI system where we screen with a, I wouldn't want to mention this against gender inequality, but some firms in the financial world would discriminate saying, I want a male employee mm. from certain university, you know, they give the name, from certain background, from maybe racial, religious background, and if you don't qualify on those, the AI cuts you out straight away from the system that screened the human resource HR team that's using this program. Okay, so it's, very good. It's a bit discriminatory. Okay. We're looking for good stuff from Tencent. Are there any good things for, at least in the use of AI for Tencent? I just want to make a comment. Um, the example you just mentioned, right, reminds me of an article that I read a couple of days ago where Citibank is going to eliminate 20,000 jobs, right, uh, agents, <coughs> brokers, and whatnot. So, uh, yeah, AI. Yeah, so AI is uh, quite prominent, and I, I'm quite bullish on, on AI and in banking. But to Tencent, okay. um, for us, um, we've been aggressively pushing AI for over 10 years. And <clears throat> you can see that in all our products. And also, um, it's part of our DNA. So you can look at, I can give you an example about WeChat, I can tell you about Tencent Games or news or videos, but I'll, I'll give you an example of what we do in Thailand. Uh, does <clears throat> anybody know Jukes here? Anybody use Jukes? So Jukes is a product of Tencent. Uh, we launched a few years ago, and uh, we were late. Um, we were late launching because there were already a lot of players in the market, but we're now the number one music streaming app in Thailand. Uh, how, how do we do this, uh, being a latecomer? So we, in everything we do, we actually tracked uh, data. So we have music, you, know, you can go to YouTube and listen to music, but what makes us special is that we have, uh, we track everything that the user does, right? There's um, on a daily basis, of act, our active users are in the millions, and the time that they spend on the app is 90 to you know 90 minutes to two hours. So that's a lot of songs. But we we not only know what songs that they're listening to, but we have a whole catalog of music that we've actually you know um, been able to identify and ensure that you know segment so that we we can associate certain types of music to certain personas. So with the data that we have, we've been collecting over the past few years, we've been able to provide recommendations uh, to elongate or engage the users more on a daily basis so that they're continuing to consume what we have on our product. So that's just an example of how we use data and continuously use machine learning so that we can recommend the right song for the right people. Do you think that this, um goes towards a discussion around uh, privacy or knowing the customer too much because it can take very a uh, very short time and not very much that 
the customer appreciates this personalization, but also gets freaked out with all this too much, somebody knowing too much about me. Yeah, I, I don't, I think there's a fine line, like you said, right? Yeah. I, um, I don't think that us, we, we, we don't abuse uh, data. Uh, I think if we're advertising too much, and it gets to your example earlier about you know Target and sending uh, advertorials uh, that could be in your face or not intended to the right for the right person, I think that that's a problem. But for us, we're only recommending songs or content that they want to consume, or we assume that they want to consume, right? So they can always skip or they can always turn it off. Right, or they can always listen on demand and pick whatever songs you want, but it's a choice that the user has. Okay, you are quite bullish on AI for financial services, bullish for AI for all these consumer uh, activities um, moving forward. Thai beverage logistics, um, you've got a different set of problems and use cases. Yeah, well, yeah. Gonna, well first of all, you, you know, even kidding is the light is pretty bright, Miss. Uh, <laughs> But uh, well, you know, we have a few. Pro well, we have several projects in terms of the uh, artificial intelligence or AI. Uh, but I want to touch on the uh, a few projects that we work with the uh, Carnegie Mellon. One of them uh, we call the agile supply chain. You know, think about it. This is how we transport and move our products in transportation. This problem came about, and you know, we discussed with CMU. is essentially nothing more than you know, sort of when you work on your internet problem. It's just you know how electric electricity move. You know, intent move, right? So, so we sort so of turned that problem into something on the on the supply chain, and it's not just AI. You know, it's just the uh, the project involved from the you know data analytics, you know, detect the anomaly and uh, find the optimization route. And you know, this is not going to be a quick win. You know, um, you know, this is the project we thought long and hard. It's 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 worth a PhD. It's a PhD dissertation. And uh, you know it's a strategic project, and um, you know I think we've been working about a year and a half now, and we're making a good uh, uh, a good progress. You know another project which is I think we will finish um, uh, in uh, pro soon this year is the, um, something in recycling, recycling plants. You know we uh, you know we apply you know image processing. You know it's a, it's a technical detail. I won't get into it. How, uh, and, and use that to, um, what you call it, uh, separate the good and bad models. And, you know, and we discussing with the, uh, with the team from the decision to take an image to have a machine uh, separate the bottles has to happen in what? 0 0.01 second. Yeah, so, you know, and- Much faster than uh, you meant, sir. Yeah, much faster. And, and you know, and, and uh, you know, if we take this problem um, a few years ago, it probably wouldn't happen. But, you know, the, the processing get better and better every year. You know, you think about it, uh, I think anything to do with the transistor speed of computing gets, what, twice fast every 18 months, year and a half, right? Anyone knows about that beside you? Right, so every 18 month, uh, speeds get better, uh, twice as fast. And if you think about, you know, from 1994, when the internet really happened to today, how many years is that? Uh, six, 24 years, right? Anyways, if you do the, the computation, a computation that would take a day in 1994 would take about a second today. So, you know, I just want to say that AI is not really, nothing really new. You know, it's, uh, you people talk about AI, deep learning, it's nothing but mathematics and it's a product. Anyone seem to know about that? So, it just happened that we have, we can compute really fast. Mm. So. so, on this stage, you've got some of the good examples of what AI can bring to an organization. I think optimization, speed, obviously, greater personalization, some things that you were not able to do before. Um, you're quite possible now, and of course in financial services some of the ways by which uh, we can make decisions faster and execute uh, faster as well. We'd like to open the floor to questions. Um, there should be some here, quite interesting. Maybe it's lunchtime. But... Probably, you know. We'll do some AI for next year's uh, event or the next event on what exactly is the right time for our panel. but. Um, Questions? 
All right, maybe one, one thing to throw yeah. to the audience, have a think about, I suppose, whether AI would bring a more equitable society than before, because for me, as you know, in Thailand in particular, inequality is a big issue. And the ability of us to use the new technology, whether it's blockchain, whether it's artificial intelligence, to bridge that digital divide gap, or not to create one, is important. In the financial service world, financial services, banks are the, are the oligopoly in Thailand, pretty much five big banks. And I see some people from, from a few banks here, so I mention this because um, intentionally to, 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 to alert this fact. I'm sure some banks are already working on projects that will use AI. One of the big things in Thailand that I hope will happen is on the social credit scoring and on the peer-to-peer -peer lending platform. In China, I'm sure like Tencent, Alibaba, and you know, a few big firms in China who have platforms and the power of these uh, powerful social media platforms are already going into financial services business. I think, who was it? Someone, China Mobile, who bought a bank. And I'm sure a few um, services that Alibaba offers, Tencent would have a service offer on the peer-to-peer the -peer lending platform. In, in Thailand, and I think the social credit scoring is important, and the AI, artificial intelligence, and the tools would allow um, the smaller guys, the SME, to be able to access um, capital in a, in a cheap, cheaper and fairer fashion. You know, there is a saying that the, it's expensive to be poor, in, and it's, it's more so, especially in Thailand, the smaller guys you are, you get expensive loans, expensive interest rates. SMEs cannot get access to, to cheaper loans. And so I think the ability to match um, the people with access cash on one side to the people, startups, SMEs who have brilliant ideas on the other side but cannot get access to banks. I mean, banks may not want NPLs, may not want orders, uh, dangerous or, or more difficult um, um, loans to give out. The AI would allow this whole analytical, the, the data, and it would be social data. It's not going to be your bank account, it's not going to be your salary, it's not going to be how much land you own, it will be your character. You must bear in mind the fact that traditionally, J.P. Morgan, when he opened his banks hundreds of years ago, you lend based on trust. And that trust is based on your character. Now, artificial intelligence would allow the use of data for your character in a more kind of a more practical manner. So in Thailand, there is a village funds that lend to people based on their honesty, their on time, they help the community, they're a good citizen, active citizen, so on and so forth. That is the social credit scores that they, they would give and allocate, and you can get loans based on your character in some village in Chacheng Sao already. But this whole AI would allow that to put on the platform and analyze from both sides. In China, I heard there is a social credit score where if you get a low score, you can't even leave China because it'd be embarrassment to the world or embarrassment to going to be rude in other countries. So, so that way, I, I can see that potential of hoping fully would, sure. would bridge that gap so, in the financial sector. Kunprin started by talking about the negative aspects of AI, but you know, we've shifted a bit by talking about the, it is, in fact, going to be good for society if we know how to use it. Your uh, comment. I was just going to no. say, uh, another learning from that is make sure you don't have deadbeats as friends. You don't have De what? Deadbeats. Okay. Yeah, as friends, right. because that actually counts against your credit score also, or your social credit score. Okay, yeah. Friends matter in, in this new world of, of AI. Anthony, uh, we're now in the topic of um, AI for good of society in general. Uh, where are what? Where do you think the opportunities are for uh, well, uh, for Thailand? I, yeah, I, I think for Thailand, I think really what what you went went through and just talked about in terms of being able to have a social scoring system to be able to enable. Uh, people that are not as advantaged as other people to actually get a leg up, I think is really a, a good point. I think that's something that we all should aspire to. Uh, other areas I think we really need to look at is in public safety and security. Public How can safety. we actually, can, you know, AI has got a lot that can actually help in that area and actually help protect people and help them get better lives. Also in terms of sustainability, how we actually manage that moving forward. Okay. I was just I was just going to use uh, that example. So I want to I want to give a shout out to Tencent because Microsoft and SAP have, <laughs> have promoted their products. But with Tencent Cloud, right, we have an example, a showcase where uh, in a city in China where we have CCTVs and with public safety, we've been, we've been able to identify criminals uh, fairly quickly whenever they're in a public space, and um, that's reduced crime by uh, by quite a bit drastically, actually. Yeah. Uh, my similar to uh, Anthony and uh, you know um, Tencent, uh, you know we promote safety and sustainability, and we are doing that within the intergroup of uh, Thai Webs already. You know in terms of safety, you know, and also you know in terms of AI, it's open a lot of opportunities. You know, new jobs, you know, new new responsibilities, and you know, and uh, um, um, 
for example, one of the examples that we're doing uh, with the uh, recycling plant again, you know, we, we're using uh, robots and, and uh, AI to actually move away from, la uh, from manual labors. You know, uh, you can imagine you move the 3,000 bucks a day, you know, labor, that's hard work. And, you know, we, we use the machine to, to uh, you know, do that work and, uh, you know, have the, our staff do something else. Okay. Know. So in this panel, we've established that um, AI can be good for business, but also good for society. Will it be bad for society? What do you th What do you think? I mean, that's you know that depends on who uses it, right? I mean, you know, I mean, uh, if someone steals my identity and sort of use it, you know, and use it, you know, put post something bad on LinkedIn, uh, I'll probably get a call from my boss. Or some, you know, it it, it it can be bad, obviously. You know, it depends on how you know who who would use it. I, th I think if uh, you know any technology can be used for good or bad. Mm. I think if you used AI for profiling and and uh, uh, you know, starting to you know identify individuals or groups uh, and prejudicing against those people, I think that would be uh, a, a, you know a step in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. I think that's where, as a as a community and as a group, we need to actually try to enforce that socially as well as by regulation. I, I like to add, you know, just if you know everything about everyone, right? And I think I, I quote it's a quote from someone. That then there's a question where the fairness will be. Right, mm -hmm. so um, you know, first you take insurance, for example. That's the, you know, when you pay insurance premium, you sort of pay the money into the pool, assuming that's the risk is the same, right? But if you know everything about everyone, uh, is, is is it fair for me to pay this amount? You know, so that's that's a big question. Okay, fairness, uh, of course, bias too. Um, I think it's inevitable, inevitable. So I think it's, we just need to accept the fact that it's around the corner, mm. and you know, as long as it serves more good than bad, you know, it's. I think it's okay. Uh, especially, in, it will help mo all industries, right? Uh, in, in particular, maybe healthcare, right? Because AI, you know, can help identify or be or treat patients, give certain protocols to patients or diagnose patients earlier. Right, before it gets to a, a terminal stage. So it, I think it helps overall, so we just need to accept the fact that it's here. All right. You know, we, we've discussed about how, how it definitely brings more efficiency. It definitely would erode uh, or take out some of the repetitive tasks that, that you know, humans do. At a, at a, they can do at a faster speed. Um, like you mentioned about the, the helps on the, the doctors when he look at the, the x-ray screen, he can so many x-ray to look through, AI can help you get to the most important x-ray quicker. You still need to use the human though. And the whole governance issue is being called into question here because uh, a distant friend of mine who, who has a very good friend who works at IT firms, and I think one of them may be presenting at this forum, this guy is in the IT department. He's able to code write and able to use AI to allow him to not be at his desk at a job, at a day job. He can basically use do away with his repetitive tasks using AI. So 60% of his job is all done. He's got free time to go and do other things. And he's gone through this one year, year and a half without telling his boss. In, in, in the end, when he disclosed, when someone found out, obviously he's fired, he's sacked. You know, but there are e efforts like this where sometimes it brings so much efficiency that some IT really expert can just do away with uh, doing some of his um, detailed jobs in a very short time and he has spare time to do other things than how do employees uh, would react or would look at ways of that. For governments to regulate, it will be also challenging because we have discussed um, at various other, other forums about universal basic income on how in the future you are going to see um, some new types of employees that are not humans. I already told you that you are trading against robots in the stock market, and you're trading against programs, algorithms, some of them driven by very powerful AI brains. Um, okay, it's still artificial, it's not real brains, and there's still input, it's coming from real human. But a lot of jobs will be lost, um, no matter like it or not, it will be lost, and especially for people who don't reskill or retool or retrain, you are, you are, or change the mindset, you are gonna be losing your jobs or your children's job profile will be changing. How do governments um, interact with that and the employment policy from the Ministry of Labor, from the government itself, I think it would be very, very challenging and interesting how the government would, would respond to those challenges. Okay, very good. Last call for questions. Okay.
The last segment of this discussion is all about how uh, Thai enterprises um, are going to succeed with AI. I think in keeping to our theme about um, accelerating the enterprise journey towards AI, what are the things that uh, Thai uh, enterprise uh, should do now in 2019 that will yield some momentum for AI? Well, you know, well, that's a tough question. But you know, I think you, you really need to have strategic uh, business strategies, right? And um, you know, you oh, you want if you want to think that well, I want to do something this year, you want to do something transformative. It's not going to happen like soon, right? So, so I'm gonna give you an example for for Taibef. What we're doing now that you know, we're actually crafting out the uh, business strategy for 2025. You know, and uh, we're looking at long term, and and you know, we expect in a few years. We will see result that happened suddenly today, right? Yep. For sustainability, and for example, today um, the result that came out was, you know, it's something that we baked uh, a few years ago. That for for strategic purposes, right? But there's still operations. That's you know, that's day to day basis. But to 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 make sure that you uh, you will be competitive for the years to come, you, you really need to have a long term strategy. You know how how it's going to be. Right, uh, I think in the 2025 or 2030, most companies, just like Tencent, probably have to be a technology-based company, right? That okay, unavoidable. The need for a long-term strategy, Mr. Chang. Um, <clears throat> I, I think that um, a lot of organizations want to do or want to implement AI, but they don't really understand AI. Right? They need to understand the practicalities of what's capable. Uh, through AI, and so I think first and foremost is if there is an organizational will to implement AI, understand what you what AI is first and foremost, and then figure out where the short-term wins are, and you know build a team around that, get resources, either train them or find resources elsewhere. But you you need to start with something that you understand, right? You capability-wise, and also understand the gaps internally, and then you know, address, the, address it with a problem statement, right? And then put resources against it and do a pilot project. Okay. I was going to add, uh, you know, so it's the business strategy first, AI strategy second, right? I mean, otherwise then you, you wouldn't know what to do. Okay. Long-term strategy, um, a current assessment of your capabilities. Uh, Anthony? Yeah, very similar. I think uh, just to summarize, that uh, would be to define the user case somewhere where you can start and see where you can get some tangible result. And I think second thing would be most important would be prepare the organization for the change. I think that, uh, you know, the other issues around technology and software, I think there's a lot of software from Microsoft and SAP and Tencent that you can actually use to accelerate uh, AI adoption into your business. But the key success factors will be how the business takes that technology and adopts it. And I think that, uh, you know, is key. To be open to, to change, but also use it as well. For, for Thai companies, you know, I, I would strongly urge you to, to look beyond um, from your networks in just this country because obviously Thailand, we are not um, a leading expert in AI. You, know, you, you probably need to look at potential foreign partners in your sector. Um, as we hear from our panelists here, yes, you do look at your strength. And for me, I mean, you have to look at, at which is your pain point and how AI or how blockchain can help because you know, AI is not going to be the silver bullet that would cure or help everything. And you must remember for Thai companies, in Thailand in particular, our strength is 0 0.4, not 4.0. And by that, I mean, I'm not saying in a, in, a, in a sarcastic, funny manner, but also by that it means that the strength of Thai people, Thai corporates are the ones where uh, we do have emotional intelligence, we have empathy towards our, our colleagues and friends. You know, if you know, my friend Kun Som you know, were to be sick and ill, I would feel sad and sorry for her. If she were promoted to be a CEO of TypeF or a TCC group one day, you know, I would celebrate and joyful for her. This kind of emotional intelligence that Thai company have, don't forget where it comes from, you know, and, and use that to leverage off, use the platform, use the technology. I'll give you one real life example, a company called Local Alike. Local Alike is a social enterprise operating in local community based tourism. So it's a 0 0.4 business. They go to the roots, to the rural, they tailor the package to, to the people who like the local experience, go to the grassroots. But yet they're now beginning to study to use AI, to use it how they can manage their data of their clients. And they can shoot their advertisement to the people, to what types that the, this person like. This person always likes to go to the beach. 
then they would offer and show Phuket, Samui, Krabi. They won't be showing Chiang Mai because this person doesn't like the mountains. So when special promotion come, they know the price point of where to attract the interest of that target customer groups. So think about how you can leverage off because Thai companies have many strengths already in the cultural economy, in the kind of inherent strength that the country has and, and your business may have. So don't think that AI can solve all your problems. It's not going to. And often it may cause more problems afterward. It just prepared a mindset, as you say, correctly ready for that mindset to, to, to take advantage of the new technologies it has and, and, and begin to use it, begin to, you're already curious about it, you come here, that's the first step. You know, seriously explore it, use the sandbox or use whatever ways that, that you can and, and find foreign partners because you know, we don't have uh, all the world's best technology in Thailand. Where should they start? Uh, a typical Thai company. I mean, you can come to, well, I'm not going to say come to, I mean, I think, interestingly for me, I've been to China many times because of my headquarters in Beijing, and I've been to Israel a lot lately, and also for cybersecurity issues, and with on the board of SET, we all go to London to see some of the company. I, I find these three places uh, fascinating because both in China, in, in Israel, um, and in in London and also in, Su in Switzerland. We're about to go to Russia, and I will tell you coming back from that how, how it's going to be like. But, but you, you, you really need to look at, I think nearer to you would be a good start. I think I urge you to look at Chinese firms who are already wanting to come to invest in Thailand. There are many good Chinese company, and if you're interested, let me know, because uh, Citix, so let's say, have a few um, AI-related uh, companies that are looking for partners to, to come to Thailand as well. You can see from my, from my name and see my Facebook page and can ping me on the private message there. Very good. Where, where should we start uh, to, to for AI? Uh, well, into we have an excellent partner, CMKL. Okay. <laughs> and Kati uh, yeah. along with those, right? I mean, for those of you, I mean, for those of you who don't know, CMU is uh, the top top university in the U.S. And you know, uh, Uber essentially built by the CMU students. Am I basically? And, and you know, and we, we and it's one of the reason we, we partner with the university here and so it's built is to drive innovation and the uh, computer engineering within Thailand. We know that it's, this is the field that's in demand and we want to grow organically as, as well. So, and, you know, beside, you know, all the uh, other countries, then I think we build, we're building something here and then uh, there's a good place to start as well. Okay. Anthony? Well, I, I think for organizations they, or businesses, they really need to focus on the, the end result. What are they trying to achieve from using AI and what's the business case? And I think that's the first place to start. And as I said, the second place is really to make sure your organization's ready for, for this change. All right. Yeah. So in this panel, what we've discovered is that AI is uh, potentially good for um, companies uh, in general, whether it's in operational efficiency, things that we did, were not able to do in the past, speed, maybe some cost efficiencies as well, making decisions faster. It's also good for society in general, especially if we promote fairness, uh, availability of funds or credit to those that did not have those as well. Uh, and there are good uh, things that we can do now uh, in order for us to achieve the benefits of AI, both for our enterprises, but also for the society as a whole. I thank you very much for your time and your comments today. I found it quite a productive session um, and hope that uh, we all learn together in this journey of discovery about the first steps to AI. Thank you very much for your time.